prayer for this weekend and said, that might happen, that Jesus might seem bigger to you and to me this weekend. The way I want to do that is I want to spend time uh, in these four stories out of John's Gospel. And I picked John, I'm a, I don't know if you're a Myers Brick person, but I'm a INFP, I'm a true F, strong F. And I feel like John is my guy. Like I feel like he could take the Myers Brick, he would be a strong F. Because the Gospels, if you've read through them, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke feel more like journalists, whereas John feels almost more like an artist. And he weaves together these uh, stories that are true stories out of Jesus' life, but he tells them, so it's like he's painting a picture of who Jesus is. Um, John, in, I think in a unique and beautiful way, shows us the beauty and glory of Jesus in ways that I've seen the whole, the whole Bible does, but in ways that are a little bit unique to the Gospels. And so what we're going to do is talk tonight about uh, Jesus and your self-righteousness. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about Jesus and your shame. Uh, and then the next day, the third day, we're about Jesus and your struggles, and then we're going to wrap it up Monday with Jesus and your sadness. And we're going to talk about John 3, 4, 5, and then 11. But tonight we're in John 3, and we're looking at a story that's a, a kind of a shocking story. Maybe you know if you grew up in the church, if you don't, it's Jesus and his encounter with Nicodemus. And I'm going to jump in. Uh, John chapter 3, if you've got a Bible or a phone, um, this is where we're starting tonight. And we're thinking about how. I love the way that Jerry Bridges will say it. He's a, an author, a beloved author in, in the Reformed community, where he says, no one is beyond the reach of God's grace, but also no one is beyond the need for God's grace. And really tonight we're looking at how no one is beyond the need for God's grace, because we're going to meet this guy who seems, if you or I were to meet him, we would never think he's a sinner, or at least a great sinner. We wouldn't know immediately what his struggles were. And Jesus has this really interesting encounter and conversation with him. So John chapter 3 we're going to read verses 1 through 15. I'm going to start reading from the ESV. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one, who has, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. We pray for us, and then I want to dive into this passage uh, tonight together. Let's pray for ourselves. Lord Jesus, we, do, we thank you that you are a God who does not remain hidden to us. Uh, you are a God who shows yourself and reveals yourself to us. And we praise you and thank you that that is true. Lord, we thank you that, um, that you long for us to know you. And Lord, we thank you that you know us. And you know us through and through and you love us. And I pray as we think about um, this passage tonight and these passages in our time together this weekend, that you would be meeting us here. That you would be showing us wonderful and beautiful things about yourself. Lord, that you would indeed become bigger to us. That we might worship you, that we might know you, that we might know what it, know, what, know what it means to be loved by you. We pray these things for Christ in your name. So tonight we're talking about that no one's beyond the need for God's grace. And there's a story from a guy, Charles Spurgeon, who's a famous Baptist preacher in the 19th century that I've always loved that kind of illustrates this. And here's a story he tells. Um, he says, many, many years ago there was a farmer who grew carrots. And he grew the biggest carrot he'd ever uh, grown before. And he didn't exactly know what to do with this carrot, so after thinking and praying about it, he decided to give it as a token of gratitude to his king, because the king was a good and loving king. 
So he marches this huge carrot up to the castle and he brings it to the king and he says, Dear king, you have never been anything but kind and benevolent to me and my family and it's a token of my gratitude. I want to give you the best carrot I've ever grown in my little garden. And the king, he's quite taken aback by this and he's moved and he suddenly declares to the farmer, he says, thank you for this remarkable gift. I own a large plot of land, several acres worth, right beside the little garden. And I've been trying to decide for a few years now what to do with it, but I think I've just decided I want this plot to be yours. Expand your garden, good farmer. Now, here's the first and here's the twist part. Now, there was a guard at the king's, uh, at the king's court who happened to race horses. And as he watched this, he thought to himself, if the king gives an entire, entire acres for a carrot, what will he give for one of my best horses? And so the next day, this guard marches the most beautiful horse he's ever raised in his stable up to the castle, and he brings it before the king, and he says, Dear king, you have never been anything but kind and benevolent to me and my family. As a token of my gratitude, I want to give you the best horse I've ever raised in my little stable. And the king simply said, Thanks. And he turned to walk away. And the guard says, well, hold on, wait, wait a second. Is there anything you might like to give me in return? And the king said, ah, I understand. You thought if I gave acres of land for a curate, that I, what would I give for a horse? But you see, the farmer gave the curate to me. But you were giving a horse to yourself. It's what I wanted to say, you know, we do, it's possible for lots of us that we do a lot of things that are good things, even things that serve the kingdom. And the question Spurgeon turned around and asked his congregation was, is it, are you doing it for Jesus or are you doing it for yourself? And I certainly, I can say that I've been a Christian now for, man, going on 20 some years, and so it's been a, a journey. I became a Christian right before my freshman year of high school, and, and I relate so much to that story because I, I think, especially as an early Christian, Self-righteousness was a real struggle for me. There were lots of things, intense, uh, disciplined Bible reading, purposeful evangelism, dutiful prayer. But if I were to be honest with you, I wasn't doing those things because I, was, I loved and was in love with Jesus, but I was doing those things because I wanted to have the reputation as the good youth group kid. I literally, we had this race to this ministry called First Priority where you interviewed and I, to become president, it was me and this other guy, and you had to tell the committee of adults, which is crazy looking back, it just shows you how much self-righteousness can permeate the Christian community. We had to tell them why we deserve to be the president, and I'll never forget looking at this committee of adults and saying, they asked me, Sammy, why should you be the president of this you know, little Christian ministry at your school? And I remember saying without blinking, because I haven't missed a quiet time in over a year. And I remember <laughs> saying it, and it was like, a, I wanted it to be like a spiritual drop the mic moment. But I like to think about what Jesus was thinking, you know, how Jesus saw that moment. And I like to think he was like, man, I can't wait to humble my friend Sammy. <laughs> because he is full of himself. And, and we have an encounter here with Nicodemus where Jesus is getting at this. That no one is beyond the need for God's grace. And so the way I want to do this passage is just to think about three things. One, because Jesus talks about this idea of the new birth. Basically what he's saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus is, Nicodemus, my, my word to you isn't keep it up, keep going, keep building your spiritual resume. My word to you is you must begin all over again because you don't even understand this thing. You must begin again. You must be born again and live by grace, learn to live by grace. So three things I'll talk about, the idea of the new birth. One, what about the necessity of the new birth? Second, I'll talk about the mystery of the new birth. And then lastly, in our time together, I want to talk about the trajectory of the new birth. So first, let me for a second about the necessity for the new birth. And this is back to our point. Nicodemus, in many ways, I don't want us to miss this point. In many ways, he was the perfect gentleman. Uh, he was very clearly a moral man, an upstanding man. He was a leading Jewish teacher, the leading Jewish teacher in all of Israel, which would be the equivalent of, of having a, an incredible chair in an Ivy League school. Uh, he's polished and nice, good manners, impeccable resume, both academically and morally. He's the kind of person the kids in the neighborhood want to be like. He's been on the cover of all the right magazines, but in, 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 you know, with, with humility, I'm sure, not bragging or talking about it too much. But there's one thing Jesus says is missing. You don't understand this gospel that I've come to preach. You don't understand 
your need for this new birth to be born again and begin to live by grace and dependence on me. Now, I want to be clear, the idea of new birth, I don't know what your background is, that for a lot of us can have some baggage. Um, they can, depending on your background, it, well, let me just deconstruct that for a second. For some of us, it can, it can conjure this kind of backward, conservative, bible belty Christianity, uh, the kind that says things like, I don't cuss, drink, or chew, or girls go with girls who do. That was a line like when I grew up. Um, and that's obviously not what Jesus is advocating. In fact, Jesus has come to, come to undo that kind of moralism. For some of us, it covers up a maybe overly emotional youth group experience where you like gave your life to Jesus 20 times, you know, and then weren't exactly sure if you were still a Christian, uh, never being quite sure that you felt enough or were on fire enough or were hip enough or learned enough or dedicated enough or sold out enough or committed enough. And I want you to understand that being born again has much less to do with feelings than it does by the uh, spirit-led transformation. And it's interesting because you can actually translate the Greek. John is famous as part of his artistic ability. Is John loves to say things that really have kind of a double meaning. And part of what you can do here is that John is saying, you must be born again, but you can also translate it, you must be born from above. In other words, God must do something in you. He must, by his spirit, awaken you and bring you to new life in ways that you cannot do for yourself. The way that Ezekiel pictured it was in two different ways. One is a, a pile of bones. He had these two powerful images. One was a pile of bones just lying there, and suddenly God breathes into them, and they take flesh and muscle and begin dancing. And the other that maybe you know is, is this image of a man with a stone heart, and God has to do this surgery where he removes this stone heart and gives him a living, beating one. And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, this hasn't happened for you. This is what you need. The one thing you need is to see your need for me. And yet you've missed it. Um, this is why Paul takes this idea, right? Right. Think about Paul in Ephesians 2. In his images, he, he imagines us being dead, as if we're these zombies walking around. And you think about it, if you're a zombie person, I got pretty into the Walking Dead, and then they lost me. Uh, the beginning of this current season, it was just too much. And maybe I can talk to some of you if you're still in, you can sell me back on it. But I was very faithful for a long time. But when you think about zombies and the idea of zombies, what does a zombie need? What a zombie doesn't need is to be taken to the latest you know, department store and pick out a new outfit, or to be taken to the barber and get a fresh fade, or to be taken to, to have a, a makeover. That's not what a zombie needs. What a zombie needs is for someone to come and from the inside out make them human again. And part of what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is, Nicodemus, you've, you've missed this. You've missed your need for me, which is the beginning place of Christianity, the necessity for the new birth. But then he says something more. He wants to talk, too, about the mystery of the new birth. And the mystery is, this is where he starts asking, you know, asking, this is where Nicodemus starts asking the question, well, Jesus, okay, even if I could buy this is what I need, this seems so weird. How in the world does this even begin to happen? And this is where Jesus really emphasizes something else, that the new birth is as unpredictable, Jesus says, as the wind, yet it's visibly powerful, too. In other words, it's something beyond our control that completely turns our lives upside down. And Jesus says that's what the Spirit's work in making people new is like. It's sudden and mysterious and unpredictable and powerful. And if you think about your own conversion for a moment, if you've ever, if you've experienced it, uh, for some of us we can point to a day, this is where I had a friend in college who was embarrassed of his conversion. Because he was like, I grew up in the church, and he's like, I have the most boring conversion of all time. I grew up in a Christian family, then I went to church, and then I went to RUF, and I like, was a Christian. And he became a Christian in college, and he was like, I'm ashamed of my testimony because I didn't get hooked in anything, I didn't have this crazy prodigal kind of life, and I'm embarrassed. And that's just where we need to think about that our conversions happen in different ways. Some of us can really remember an hour, some of us can remember something that was very dramatic for us, but I love this analogy that N.T. Wright gives, it's helpful to me. He gives this analogy of an alarm clock. He says, some of us hear, don't think about the way you respond to your, your alarm, your phone, or your alarm clock. Some of us, when we hear it, we immediately jump out of bed and we're ready for the day. And others of us hit snooze once or twice or three times. Or if you're like me, I feels like that's my spiritual gift, is the ability just to, to hit snooze without even knowing that it hit snooze. Um, and then you finally groggily pull yourself up into the shower and then you realize in the shower, okay, I'm awake now. And he says that's what conversion is like. Sometimes it's dramatic. You know it's happened. 
and other times it's gradual, and you kind of realize at some point, oh, this did happen to me. And, and this is part of the part of the miracle. This is one of what Tim Keller says is one of the litmus tests of Christianity. Is the whole point is the spirit, the the the, the mystery of the new birth, isn't exactly how it happened. The mystery is that it's a miracle to you. The, 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 it's a miracle to you that you could be a Christian. That Jesus would place his love and grace upon you. That Jesus would choose you. That Jesus would bring you to life. The miracle isn't how it happened. The miracle is that it happened. And that you have become a Christian. And it's the miracle of being born again. I love the way uh, my friend Richie Sessions said that he's a campus minister at Vanderbilt. He talks about thinking about middle school, and he talks about, I don't know what your middle school is like, but mine, we played a lot of basketball for some reason, and the way it always worked out, especially in seventh and eighth grade, was we would have the two cap the, the teacher would pick captains, and then the captains would pick from the, the, you know, all the guys, in my case. And so, you know, the way it always went was there were always, it felt like two kinds of picks. One was the kind of pick that you knew was going to stack your team. You know, like the guys or the girls that you really knew were going to make you dominate and win the game. And the other kind of pick was what he called the mercy pick. The, the kid that was going to double dribble a lot. The kid who might hustle some, but even if in their hustling they were going to foul a bunch and it was probably not going to win you a game. And he said, when it comes to Christianity, all of us are mercy picks. This is what offends Nicodemus. Is he wants he thinks of himself as a lottery pick. And Jesus is trying to say, Nicodemus, you've not understood that you're a mercy pick just like everyone, just like every sinner is. So he first we talk about the necessity, the need for the new birth, and then we talk about the mystery of it, but then the last thing I want you to see is the result or the tra trajectory, what it does in our lives. Nicodemus here, and he's so close to the kingdom, and yet he's so far. Um, and you can see in the way that he mainly thinks about Jesus. He, he really gets us that he, he thinks about Jesus in two main ways. First, he thinks about Jesus as this great teacher. He calls him rabbi. And he comes in, in the night because he really does want to learn from him. There's, there's a humility in the that he see, recognizes Jesus as a teacher of profound wisdom. And he comes to him to get some of that wisdom, to get some of that moral and spiritual insight. And the second thing, the other thing he sees Jesus as is clear in this text is he sees him as a miracle worker. He says, we've seen your signs. It's undeniable that Jesus has done some powerful and amazing things. He's healed the sick, the deaf, and the blind. He's turned water into wine at this point. And Nicodemus, no doubt, has heard accounts of these miracles and believes them. And maybe even firsthand has heard the results of the stories of these miracles. And so he sees him as this great teacher, and he sees him as this miracle worker. But there's one thing, huge thing, that he doesn't see him as. And what he doesn't see him as is a savior. What he doesn't see him as is the person he needs to come and die for his sin. A savior to deliver him from his bondage. This is why Jesus does that really weird thing on his call out. He starts telling this random story about Moses and a serpent being lifted up in the desert. He's actually going back to the story from Numbers 21. I don't know if you remember the story, but the story is Israelites are in the desert. And literal snakes are wandering through the camp and, and biting people and, and it's getting bad and people are dying. And Moses constructs through God's command this bronze serpent. And what the people of Israel are supposed to do is anytime a snake bites them, they're supposed to, Moses is going to hold this serpent, this bronze serpent up. And all they're simply supposed to do is to look to this bronze serpent and their snake bite will be healed. It's a really weird story. And yet Jesus takes it as his own. And he's saying something. Nicodemus, you recognize me as a teacher. Nicodemus, you recognize me as a miracle worker. But Nicodemus, do you see that I am the bronze serpent lifted up in the desert for the people of God, broken by sin, snake bitten, cursed by the fall, to look to, because I'm the one who's going to be cursed that you might become the righteousness of God. Your spiritual resume you don't understand in your spiritual resume you're working enslaving for yourself in the name of God as part of your snake business and I've come yes to deliver you even from that even from that self-righteousness that can grip so many of us and it's so dangerous because we don't see it we're always the last ones to see it 
It's the cliche of we're always the last one to see the brownie in our face. We're always the last person to see the bug come in. We're always the last person to see. And Jesus is saying this is part of the curse that Nicodemus is facing. And yet he's come. Jesus is saying, I've come to be lifted up in the desert. That you might look to me and be healed. That you might look to me and be delivered. This is the trajectory. The trajectory of the new birth. I don't know if you, one of the weirdest, I'm a huge movie fan, one of the weirdest, but the most interesting Brad Pitt movies is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. And you know the story, it's a simple story, he, he ages backwards, right? And the more he grows, the more needy he becomes until finally he's a baby again. He's utterly dependent on the love and care of his parents. And I love that image because I believe that's exactly what it means to be a Christian. And this is what Jesus is, is preaching to Nicodemus. Is that Nicodemus, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be born again, is you become like a little baby again. Utterly dependent upon the love and care of your father. Utterly dependent. Knowing your inability to do anything, and knowing your need for your father through the work of his son to do everything that the good news for you and me as he has I love the story of John Newton's life where he's at his deathbed. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, and he's got these incredible letters, just really pastoral letters that he wrote to all kinds of people and is, and is under his care. And he's got this one story of his life where he's, he's dying, he's on his deathbed. And they come to him and they, they're asking you know, what it meant for him to be a Christian. And he says, I'm old and I've forgotten many, many things, but two things I remember that I'm a great sinner in Christ is a great savior. And what I love about this story is it has a sequel. If we were to go down the Gospel of John and we were to get to John 19, we find Nicodemus again. And here's Nicodemus who undoubtedly left this conversation struggling and confused and challenged and maybe not knowing what to do and is and is his worldview being turned upside down in the best of ways, we find him again in John 19. And it's Nicodemus and his apparently new friend, Joseph of Arimathea, and they ask if they could come and take Jesus' body to give it a proper burial. And what I love about this is at some point, Nicodemus experienced new birth. At some point, Jesus, at some point, the bitterness of his sin became a thing for him. And Jesus began to be sweet. And the idea of grace began to be sweet so much that he risked his own reputation and boldly come and comes and asks for the body of his Savior. And the question for you and for me is, has Jesus in the same way become sweet to us? Has Jesus, have we experienced, part of the way you know you've experienced and you've heard this, Jesus and his grace have begun to be sweet to us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the story. We thank you that even now Nicodemus is with you. And Lord, he's no doubt begun to be able to laugh at himself. And he's no doubt begun to be able to rest, obviously, in your grace and worship even now in your friend. And Lord, we pray. Some of us don't relate to the idea of self righteousness at all. And some of us really do. Would you remind us that, that we're not beyond, not just our need? of your forgiveness, but we really are not beyond you to take a self-righteous person like me and like so many of us in this room and begin to transform us from the inside out by your grace. Would you do that tonight and the rest of this weekend together? We pray these things with Christ in your name. Amen.